Hi, everybody. I am so glad to be here today. I'm here with Frog and Monkey. They usually come with me on my talks and trainings. They are not part of the program today. I'm setting them aside. And Chris, thank you for the intro. I need to correct one thing. Um, it's not 400,000 people. I've personally coached 40,000, kind of important. And I've done that through email since 2011. In fact, it's more than that, but I stopped counting at 40,000. It's more like 60,000. That's a, a kind of an important correction. I, I'm really big on accuracy. But let me dive into what we're talking about today. Um, there has been a problem in the world of behavior change is that people cannot think clearly about how behavior really works. This is a problem for everyday people that think it's all about motivation and they get stuck. It's a problem for people like us who are designing products and services. And sometimes the more you read, the more confused you get about how behavior really works. Well, what I'm hoping to do today and the short time that I have is to give you some breakthrough insights about how to think about behavior systematically and clearly and give you superpowers in the next 17 minutes and 20 seconds of thinking about behavior and also designing for behavior change accurately. Behavior is systematic. If it feels confusing and jumbled, what I want you to do is set that aside and start thinking about behavior in a fresh new way. There is a system behind behavior. And over the last 10 years, I've developed a new set of models and a new set of methods. And together, I call this behavior design, not behavioral design. In 2011, we renamed my lab at Stanford to the Behavior Design Lab. That's what I call my work. Now, my new book, Tiny Habits, Yes, it's entitled Tiny Habits, but it's really about behavior design. Uh, everything you see in the box there, those models and methods, those are new models, those are new methods, and I cover those things in the book with a special emphasis on the Tiny Habits method. I'll just touch a little bit on Tiny Habits today, but mostly I'm gonna talk about the Fog Behavior Model. Oh, if you're in the UK, this is what the cover of the book looks like too. So the Fog Behavior Model, I'm gonna, show you how to use my model to think about behavior over time. Some people have assumed that the behavior model is just a snapshot in time and that's it. No, there's ways you can think about what happens over time. And that's the thing that has interested me the most. So I'll lay the foundation for you now and hopefully going forward so you can think about behavior clearly and be more effective in your work. So my behavior model is this. Behavior happens when three things come together at the same moment. There's motivation to do the behavior. There's ability to do the behavior. And there's a prompt. And when those three things converge, a behavior happens, whether you want it to happen or not. And it's always a function of those three things. Now, I used to call the prompt a trigger. And two years ago, I changed it to prompt. Trigger was a confusing word. And so it is now called prompt. And what I mean by that is anything that says do the behavior now. Your phone ringing is a prompt. A stoplight changing is a prompt. Uh, something that says click here is a prompt. And so this is the current and final form of the behavior model, M, A, and P. Now you can use this for many things, including thinking about how to stop a behavior. So if you want to stop a behavior, if you can get rid of motivation or reduce it, the behavior will diminish or stop. If you can make the behavior harder to do or impossible, you stop the behavior. And if you can remove the prompt, you can stop the behavior. The model itself is universal. It applies to all cultures and all ages. The individual differences and the cultural differences come in on the three components. What motivates individuals differ. And even in different cultures, different things motivate people. So this is where the differences come in. People's ability differs. And within cultures, there's different ability factors and characteristics. And there are differences in how you prompt individual or how you prompt people within cultures. So B equals MAP is universal the individual or cultural differences happen within the components. To visualize the model in two dimensions gives us even more insight and clarity and power. And that's what I'm gonna focus on now. Um, along one axis, you have level of motivation. Motivation for any given behavior can range from high to low. 
then you have ability to do the behavior. And that ranges from high to low. But on the right side, I write it up as easy to do. That's the same thing as high ability, but you're gonna see later that calling it easy to do is more helpful. And then there's a prompt and prompt is like lightning happening. It's a moment in time. It's not well represented on a two dimensional graphic like this. And then there's an action one. And this is really, uh, the new stuff I'll be showing you uh, is highlighting how this action line works. And this is really important. And if somebody is prompted when they're above the action line, when they have some combination of motivation and ability, they do the behavior. So everything in the upper right-hand corner, anything above the action line, I call the action zone. And somebody can be anywhere above the action line when prompted, they do the behavior. In contrast, if they're below the action line, they don't do the behavior when prompted. You're gonna see some examples of this coming up. Now the action line is super important. I've never shared it quite in this way before, but I wanna be really clear. The behavior model makes some assertions. And one of the assertions is this, the higher the level of motivation, the more likely the behavior will happen. Now, you know this from your personal experience, the more motivated somebody is to do something, the more likely they are to do it. But in the model, and notice how this works on the action line, as motivation goes up, so look at the orange bar, as that goes up, there's more and more likelihood that somebody is above the action line. And if motivation is extremely high, well, it's extremely likely that somebody will do the behavior. And as motivation drops, it becomes less likely. So notice how the action line, that curve helps show that. Now, at the same time, the action line also applies to ability. And I'm gonna start here by showing, let's imagine, well, the assertion here is the harder the behavior is to do, the less likely it has happened. And you know this from your personal experience. If you're asking somebody to donate $10,000, which is hard to do, that's uh, less likely to happen than asking somebody for 10 cents. So let's visualize it on the model. So as a behavior gets harder to do, so as the line moves toward hard to do, then there are less and less likelihood that somebody is above the action line. And so if it gets really hard to do, there, it might require high levels of motivation to do, low levels of motivation won't uh, get somebody to the behavior. And finally, if it gets so hard to do that it's impossible, then you won't do the behavior. And that's why in the upper left hand corner of my model, there's this gap. If behaviors are impossible, like so hard to do that they're impossible, no level of motivation will get somebody to do that behavior. So, Often people think of the fog behavior model as something to help you understand one time behaviors. And that's true. But what I'm gonna focus on from here forward for the next 11 minutes and five seconds is to use the behavior model to understand how behavior happens over time. And you can think of this as behavior sequences. Behavior one leads to behavior two, leads to behavior three and so on. And this is the area that I'm pretty obsessed about and the current project in my Stanford lab. Each one of these behaviors has its own behavior model associated with it. So behavior one, in order for it to happen, there has to be some level of motivation, ability, and a prompt, which then leads to behavior two, behavior, behavior three, and so on. So, and each one of these behaviors help the subsequent behavior to happen. So behavior one, increases ability perhaps for behavior two. Behavior two increases motivation and so on. There's more from me and my lab coming on this. Uh, it's kind of geeky right now, but we're developing a notation system to write out how behavior happens over time. And here's an example of what it looks like. I'm not gonna go deep into this. This is a little bit of a teaser of what's coming. What I do have for you today that's new and not shown before are some videos, some dynamic visualizations of how behavior happens over time. And I have a handful of examples to show you some typical behavior patterns, mapping them to the behavior model. This first video will show you how motivation fluctuates over time. And in this case, motivation drops. Somebody starts super motivated to do something and it's something hard and as motivation drops, they can no longer do it. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's human nature. We set ourselves up to do hard things and in some ways to fail. 
let's watch a video that uh, shows how this works from the behavior model. And so let's play video number one. Glenn works in insurance, but he does not like his job. He wants a career in software development. So Glenn signs up for an online course to learn JavaScript. The course takes 10 weeks. Glenn must do one hour of homework each day to pass. During week one, Glenn is super motivated. He does his homework and delivers his JavaScript projects on time. During week two, Glenn starts to struggle. His motivation sags and he doesn't do his homework reliably. Glenn thinks about all of the money he spent to take the JavaScript course, and this temporarily motivates him to do the required homework. During week three, his motivation tanks. Learning JavaScript is hard, and he can't find out how to motivate himself to do the work. Glenn misses deadline after deadline and finally drops the course. Damn. Did that look familiar? Yeah, that happens all too often. And too often when we create products and programs, we set people up to fail by making it hard to do. Next video is about how motivations can conflict with each other. Part of you wants to do it, part of you doesn't want to do it. And it's going to be applied to a topic that's familiar to all of us right now, which is wearing masks. So let's play the next video that shows the dynamic nature of motivation and how they can be conflicting motivators. Meet Jake. He does not wear a mask when shopping. He sort of believes a mask will protect him from COVID-19. However, the only mask he owns is painful to wear. So this adds up to not wearing a mask. He is below the action line. Then one day... Jake's grandma made him a mask that was comfortable, not at all painful. She gave it with a note, please wear this to protect yourself and me. This changed things for Jake. Now above the action line, Jake wears a mask when shopping. Jake wore his mask reliably until Jake watched a TV program saying masks aren't very effective at protecting you. In addition, one guy on the program said the whole mask thing was a conspiracy to control citizens, make them sheep. Jake believed it. Despite his grandma's pleas, Jake no longer wears a mask. Damn. So motivations can conflict with each other, pushing people up or down in relationship to the action line. And you could write this out, behavior one, behavior two, behavior three, and so on. The next visualization has to do with how motivation grows over time. This is almost the opposite of the first video where uh, the motivation went down. In this case, motivation grows. And notice that it grows because somebody feels successful and then they can do harder and harder things. So let's play the next video. Jeff loves music. So for Christmas, his niece gets him a musical instrument called a kalimba. This is nothing like a piano or guitar. To Jeff, it's just plain confusing. But the kalimba was a gift, so he feels obligated to practice a little bit every day. At first, Jeff plays the kalimba for just three or four minutes each morning. It feels like a chore, but he practices taking baby steps each time. After a week or so, Jeff's brain starts to understand kalimba better. It's not so confusing, and the music he plays sounds better and better. He starts to practice longer each day, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Jeff quickly gets better on kalimba, and he feels successful playing, so he keeps going. Some days he will practice for 30 minutes, sometimes for an hour. He pushes himself most days. Can he play simple pieces by Mozart? Yep. Let's see about jazz. Hmm, pretty good. How about a nocturne by Chopin? Well, he plans to tackle that one in his next practice session. So the videos you saw, the preceding videos were all about motivation and how it works, but we can also look at how ability works in relationship to the action line. 
And this video shows specifically that when you make something easier to do, you don't have to fuss around with motivation. You can get people over the action line. So let's watch the next video that shows this dynamic. Carmen knows it's important to eat fresh vegetables every day, but in her new job, she's busy. When she gets home from work, all she can manage is popping a frozen pizza into the microwave. Part of her brain seems to say, hey, Carmen, you know vegetables would serve you so much better. But another part of her brain says, oh, that's hard work. Buying the veggies, washing them, cutting, cooking, cleaning up. So Carmen feels this struggle inside. She wants to eat fresh veggies, but she just can't seem to find enough motivation. At the grocery store one day, Carmen discovers something new. Fresh vegetables already washed, cut, and ready to cook. The veggies are even packaged into portions with seasoning on the side. Wow, Carmen thinks. This seems so easy to do. She buys enough veggies for the rest of the week. To her delight, each evening after work, she finds herself preparing, yes, fresh vegetables for dinner. She realizes this truth. Simplicity changes behavior. So as you saw, by making things easier to do, you can uh, put yourself or others over the action line, but the reverse is true as well if you make something harder to do. There's also ways to use the behavior model to think about how you change a choice. And we won't play this video right now, but you can go to behaviormodel.org to see how you can think clearly about choices and changing choices using the behavior model. And one of the takeaways here is people don't always choose the thing they're most motivated to do. If it's much easier to do, they might choose something that they're less motivated to do, but it's easier to do. The last video is about prompts in populations. So I'm doing two new things at once. Now this video is about how prompts work, but also how the behavior model can be applied to populations. Uh, so let's watch this next video. Stanford University asks their 200,000 alumni to donate every year. One objective is to increase the percent of alumni who donate annually. Let's suppose that Stanford typically asks alumni to donate $100. At any given moment, if Stanford prompts alumni to donate, Perhaps 15% will take action immediately. They are already above the action line. That's okay, but savvy fundraisers know that when you're asking for money, the timing of the request makes a big difference. You don't want to prompt alumni to donate after Stanford gets bad press. The alumni at that moment would be less motivated and the response rate would drop and you don't want to prompt alumni to donate after a financial crisis strikes. <laughs> Again, the response rate would be lower because most alumni would feel they have less money to give, making the $100 donation seem harder to do. Yes, the timing of the prompt matters. Savvy fundraisers, at least for annual giving, want to prompt donations when the greatest percentage of alumni are above the action line. This could be after Stanford wins a national championship in basketball, or even better, right after Stanford researchers discover a cure for COVID-19. In this case, the percentage of alumni over the action line would surge, probably giving record-breaking results. There's another way fundraisers can maximize the percent of alumni donating. They can make it easier to do. For example, Stanford could reduce the donation request from $100 to $20. While this may lead to fewer dollars donated in total, the percent of alumni donating would go up. And when it comes to annual giving at Stanford, the focus is on level of participation, the percent of alumni donating. It's not the total dollars donated. So, if Stanford can't find a good moment of high motivation for their alumni, well, you know, like a cure for COVID-19, then reducing the suggested donation may be the best solution.
Well, I hope those videos helped you see how to use the FOG behavior model in new ways. Takeaways. As you think clearly about human behavior, you can use this version of the model. You can think of it in this way, or you can think of it as sequences, whichever one is most appropriate for what you're doing. The tiny habits method, the method that I've coached over 40,000 people in, the method that is, I think, the simplest and fastest way to create habits comes from me looking at my own model. I understood that making things easier to do would get people over the action line. And then I saw here, like, wow, the habit's really easy to do. Motivation can be high or low. In contrast, if you make the habit hard to do, then when motivation drops, they stop doing it. So then I started goofing around with my own habits, making them super easy to do, which then led to sharing it with others. And I started teaching it in 2011 online in a free five-day program. So there you have it. Behavior design is a system. The cornerstone of it is the fog behavior model. And I shared some new aspects of that today, the dynamics of human behavior. I'm hoping this helps you go from being stuck to unstuck, giving you superpowers. You can find more in the book. You can find more at tinyhabits.com. You especially can go to behavior model. Like this presentation was mostly about behavior model and not tiny habits. And I hope this gives you breakthroughs. And if you really want to up your game, there is a professional boot camp that I do once a month, just 12 people on Zoom. Email me and we can talk about if that's appropriate for you. Thank you very much. Chris. DJ Fogg, thank you very much. Listen, we're going to get in a couple of quick questions here. One is from somebody quite astute, clearly in the behavior change business or science. How do we decide between a health belief model, a calm B model, a triandus model, and the fog model? There are other models out there. And the calm yeah. B, for example, is capability, opportunity, and motivation. It sounds a lot like the B map. It sounds kind of derivative of my model, yes. Of course, I'm biased. I think the FOG behavior model is the right one to use. Motivation, ability, and prompt are discrete concepts. They're not overlaps. The action line is critical. You can see without the action line, we don't really understand how behavior works. So everybody's going to have their opinion and bias. And of course, I have mine. I encourage people to learn how to use the behavior model and see how it works. Next question is, is there a way to calculate the action line or is it always a subjective oh, I love that. The way it's drawn on the model, it's a conceptual curve. But there are people in the industry that are mapping populations to the action line and saying, okay, 20% of people are answering the survey. If we increase motivation, how much lift do we get? If we make the survey easier to do, how much lift do we get? And they're making strategic decisions on product design and interventions based on what they're seeing in their data. So you don't have to have the perfect shape of the line. If you can map a population, you could even sample a population and say, what happens when we increase motivation in this way? Or if you want to help people stop behaviors, how do we make it harder to do and what kind of impact does that have? BJ Fogg, listen, thanks very much.